Broadcasting from Chico, California, this is the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast, where we discuss NorCal fly fishing, guiding, fishery science and management, conservation, and more. No better, fish better. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. This episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast is brought to you by California Trout. Working throughout the state to ensure we have resilient wild fish thriving in healthy waters for a better California. Support Caltrout's innovative science-based work by becoming a member or donating today at caltrout.org. Welcome to a bonus episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I've got uh, Oliver Knight at, at the house tonight. We're about to go uh, striper fishing in the morning, so this is bonus content for you guys Um, we're going to switch it up a little bit because as as some of you may or may not know, um, Oliver's YouTube channel is, is pretty big. He's been doing it for quite some time. Uh, six years, right? Honestly, uh, maybe even a little longer, longer. Yeah. So eight years. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to talk about on this bonus episode of the show while we're on the couch, having some whiskey, we're basically just going to, I kind of want to learn about like how to run a YouTube channel if you're an angler. If you want to start a YouTube channel, like how you got going, you know, what got you into it initially, um, how you've grown it over the years, the hardware that you used back then versus today, and like all your production workflow stuff too, because I just find it really interesting because we're about to, you know, for 2020, Barless is about to embark on building out our own YouTube channel. And we've been talking about that over dinner tonight, but I really thought it would be cool to just sit down and kind of like, you know, go through the whole evolution of, of your production from when you started till, till today and how the hardware has changed over the years, how your technology, how the technology you used have changed over the years and, and how you've adapted everything. Cool. Absolutely. So let's like, let's talk first about, um, you know, what, made you start the youtube channel and what year was this so the big bass dreams youtube channel is what most people think about when they ask or refer to my youtube channel which is a little confusing because 2020 is the year i really launched my own personal youtube channel which is just all over nine right and we'll get into that later but uh, going back to that we we are Referring to the Big Bass Dreams channel in this discussion. And okay. How that channel started. So that's what you started with, not. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I'm that's gonna, what most people. Know I'm going to pour some more whiskey. With. I need Do you want some? Man. Yeah. Okay. And, and you can keep talking even though you're in the other room. These wireless mics do everything. Beautiful. Um, Where did I put my cup? I thought I brought it in here. I don't know. Did I steal it? I could. <laughs> here, I'll grab you another one. Okay, and I know we'll, where they we'll, are. We'll keep talking. Um, so you got it going. So back Big then. Bass Dreams as a brand, an entity, a movement, a film project started in the year 2012. And okay. I have already been dabbling with capturing video since the mid to late 2000s because of the unique fishing experiences that I was living. And I was telling you over dinner, I'd I'd be trying to explain some of the scenarios that I was experiencing and living through to my closest fishing buddies. And they were just pretty much calling bullshit. (laughs) So this was literally just... This is real talk. This is how all of this started. Dude, so your motivation at the time was like, I got to fucking show my buddies that this is actually happening. thousand percent, because they thought I was blowing smoke (laughs) up their ass. So you didn't have this big thing to start a media empire (laughs) back then? (laughs) Man, this started like over uh, you know a glass of whiskey, talking talking trash with my boys. And now it's we're coming full circle with another glass too. That's yeah, cool. It's wild, man. It's okay, wild. so you start basically self documenting as, as forensic evidence, basically. Yeah, just to throw it in their face, and be like, oh yeah, yeah what are you going to say now? Because look okay. at this, you know, wolf pack of giant yeah. bass taking turns trying to eat a ten inch swim bait. So on a lake we all grew up fishing. Yeah. So what were you? Um, what were you shooting on back then? Man, I experimented with a couple things. My first my first foray was I borrowed my bo- good friend Alex Arias's camcorder. His mom bought him for like Christmas or Are something. Are you serious? Like, like the a big ones? Handy cam, like Holy crap. Probably the generation after those giant like shoulder mounted Panasonic ones. Does this does this like around. predate GoPro then? Oh, big time. 
Oh, shit. Big time. So, like, dude, there were no mounts, right? This right. This is when I had my first aluminum boat that I had decked out, DOS boat style, if you guys yeah. are familiar with the Meat Eater uh, project that I was a part of last year. Yeah, and if you haven't watched that, uh, you should definitely watch it. It's a Meat Eater production. And then there's an episode with uh, April Vokey and Oliver. And that's how you came up on my radar. But anyway, your, do- your own DOS boat. Yeah, so my own DOS boat. And we actually have a whole DOS boat part, or uh, we call it the Dream Machine 1.0 project, which is when I go and rebuild that boat project. But, like, we just take it to a whole new level of absurdness. Yeah. Uh, so that's on the Big Bass Streams YouTube channel if you're curious. But I'm in my first boat. It's got this ghetto, you know, bass boat deck and built on the frame of this leaky 14-foot it, uh, aluminum piece of crap to be honest with the trolling motor on it but it dude it was my dream boat at the time yeah it got me off the bank you know like, yeah you know, that's like, that's huge i don't need to call somebody to go that's huge I'm getting a boat's off. very liberating it when you really get is, your first yeah. boat yeah so i'm trying to figure out like well, how the hell am i gonna mount this freaking awkward camera on this boat to capture like the fishing so I like bought a tripod and like I try to like jimmy rig a bungee cord system and I'm on my home lake which is like a 240 acre lake uh, down in SoCal and I'm trying to film on like a hot summer day and it's wakeboard boats and jet ski wakes and <laughs> I get hit with this series of boat wakes and this tiny little like leaky piece of shit <laughs> and <laughs> all I hear is a clunk clunk Oh, done. I turn around and I see my boy's camcorder. Bro, and, dude, I came up from very humble beginnings, right? Like, I was dead broke at the time. Like, I put yeah. everything I owned into that boat project. Yeah. Like, I probably had barely enough money to get to the lake, with you know, and, and pay my entry fee. So, I'm seeing this expensive at the time camcorder teeter-tottering on this tripod and it goes into the drink and all in one motion. This is when I'm pretty young and athletic still. And I'm in the water and I grab the tripod and I'm probably a good 30 yards off the bank, which doesn't seem like much, but when you're wearing all these clothes and you're trying to hold this tripod with your boy's expensive camera above the water to try not to ruin it, and your boat's floating away from you because the wind is up. Total shit show. It's just a total shit show. And it's like, dude, what am I doing right now? And I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm trying to like float on my back and get to the bank. And I finally feel... A it it sounds like today when you see the dude's videos where they're, they're trying to save their drone. And they just, they catch it in the last two feet. And then they're like, they realize they're up to their elbows in water, up to their Absolutely. neck in water. That, that video is all time. Yeah. It was like the perfect... Like shot. Okay, so you had your first outing was just a complete disaster. It sounds like. So what did you do? What what was it? Okay, so like fast forward, say a year or so. So I found a a smaller, more compact camcorder. I think it was a Sanyo. Still predating. GoPro. GoPro is not even on the radar. Not even on the radar. Okay, well. This is probably just before the original Hero, not the Hero One, came out. (laughs) Not a waterproof one, no, by the way. You, no. I, th- I think they had an underwater housing back then, right? Maybe shooting SD, I assume. Dude, it was, it was archaic yeah. compared to what's available now. Yeah. And then you got the issue of battery and power source, right? Mm-hmm. So I had to buy like a crap load of these shitty little batteries that would last twenty to thirty minutes, and then you know, it's hard enough to catch your, capture these fish and when you don't have the distraction of running a studio <laughs> yeah. like a, a ghetto one at least yeah and you were doing a one camera shoot back then right yeah, that, yeah. that's all i could afford and, yeah but i just needed to capture that crazy stuff that i was seeing and living yeah. to number one just show my boys like yeah you guys are full of it like this i'm really making this happen when did you start doing mount like doing a mount that would some would say was semi-professional like when was it around the same time, or were you, were you still doing, like, the tripod with the bungees, or what so were like you doing? Hero One is really when I started becoming way more efficient at capturing the content, because they made it easier, right? They, they made a, a rudimentary mounting system with stickies. At least you could stick mm-hmm. this Like stuff. the 3M tape? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could stick it on a console on a bass boat. Yeah. And even to this day, if you could only choose one angle, it'd probably be the angle I'd choose. Off the console. Off the driver's side console, facing the front deck, that big fish eye view, you pretty much capture just about everything. Because usually you're fishing in front of the boat. Right. And uh, yeah, 
that that was really the pivoting point because I was using that GoPro Hero One before the fishing world had become aware of it. Like really, like yeah. I'm still a little bitter because I've had a couple <laughs> GoPro deals and that like, guy still don't have one now. Yeah, that's pretty and weird. It's like, well, okay, so talk about um, like your production workflow. So when after you got everything recorded, you got home. Like, what what did it, what was the land? What was it like for you back then? Like, what did you? What was your setup? Well, just curious. Much like my fishing experiences, a lot of what I do now has been built around failure. Yeah. Right. So yeah. We want to talk about data managing and file management and backing yeah. things up. Dude, these are things that I didn't and do. Back we're gonna get on. We're gonna definitely get into that a little later in this this particular episode. But tell. Okay. So explain. What was it like back then? Do you remember? Like, what did what were you doing? Because there's probably a lot of people right now doing what you were doing X amount of years ago. Oh, I cringe when they tell me about it. Yeah. Especially so some of my clients or my buddies. Yeah. Are trying to what did it look like? World. You got the SD card. You pull the SD out. What were you doing? At first, I would just leave it on the SD card and call it good. Yeah. And then I started transferring them to my my computer, my desktop, and then it would just bog my computer down completely. Yeah. And then that computer would crash and I wouldn't have anything backed up. So I'd lose all that footage. I mean, everything that you could have done wrong, I've done wrong. Yeah. And then you're correcting along the way. So like where we're going to go with this whole episode is the evolution of, of, you know, all the, I want to just cover all the stumbling things you did and then how you, how you tweaked it, how you evolved your, 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 you know, everything from how you shoot to the cameras you use to your production workflow and where you're at today and where you see things headed. Mm. That's kind of basically the goal. Gotcha. I guess I should have said that at That's the start. Off. I know. We got, I think we got totally off tangent and we didn't even yeah. touch on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So when, <laughs> when did, so YouTube is getting going around the same time or no? Yeah, a little bit. Pretty, it was, right? A little, a little prior yeah. to that. But, yeah. Uh, it was definitely there as a space that I can upload videos to show people. Yeah. So it came onto my radar in that fashion. And then. At the time, Facebook was immensely popular mm-hmm. with my audience, especially. And we had. And your audience at the time was just basically your boys, right? I started. Yeah. And know, then about boys, a year. And then regionally. So yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. The rest of the bass fishing world just kind of like started discovering like what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, with this big bait scene and what I was doing specifically because I was just on the tear, man. Like that's, that's where the name Big Bass Dreams came from. Like I felt like I was living the dream that every bass fisherman yeah. has, has, you know, played in their heads. And that's what you're known for, you know, is getting the big, the big boys. Man, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty so cool that I'm able to share those moments with people and yeah. go back and relive them. Yeah, and learn. When so when you you know around the same so YouTube's coming up at the same time. Yeah. You've got a, a, a basically a one point of failure, redundant failure of, of how you're storing your content, occasionally losing stuff. What did you do to tweak it like from there with so YouTube I'm, and the game? I started looking into external hard drives and then buying doubles and double backing everything up. Double. Okay. So like two pair, two exact pairs of the same drives and okay. just redundant copy yep. and stuff. Absolutely. And why were you doing it like a redundant copy? Because I'd have that external hard drive crash. Right. And I couldn't afford to have that data recovery done. Yeah. And it was cheaper just to have another hard drive. Yeah. As a redundant backup. And at this time, were you, did you have a day, were you doing a day job also or did? Yeah. Yeah. What yeah were I was you... still in construction management. So okay. Project engineer, project manager, and then an estimator towards the end of it. And this is very much a side, it was still a side project at this point. Yeah, it was really just a passion project. Yeah. Right. It was, it became, Hey guys, come over to the house. I, you guys will not believe what happened on the lake. Today. Yeah. And then, you know, three or four of my closest fishing buddies. And it's like, dude, you had to put this on a DVD. Cause this is back when DVDs are a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. at the time there had only been a couple of like big fish, big bait oriented DVDs like put out. Yeah. And there had been some, some gap in time. Like the big bait posse was one of the first ones. Um, man, uh, I'm having trouble recalling, uh, some of the other early titles, but it was definitely early in that scene. And I was like, man, I don't know. Like if I put myself on the map in that way, like I just kind of understood what that would 
me and my lifestyle change, mm-hmm. the attention, good and bad, and just making what I was doing, which is trying to capture the biggest bass I could, even more difficult. Because now people are paying attention when I'm on the lake. They're paying attention to what I'm doing, where I'm at. This, that, and a third, man. It just makes it that much harder. But I was like, man, this stuff is too special for people not to see. Like, if someone can find inspiration and insight to go live even just one of those moments that we cap- we were capturing at the time, like, it was worth it for me. So, that was really the, the big motivating factor. Because I saw what it did within my own circle, even. Yeah. Everybody got all fired up. And this is like the second or third uh, wave of this swim bait phenomenon. Like, I've been in this game for a while, man. Like, there are guys that are coming into it all the time. And to them, it's brand new. But, like, I've seen this wave come three or four times over already. And now I'm seeing it internationally, too, on my travels over the past yeah. 12 to 18 months. So, with with respect, and I'm just going to, like, steer it back to the heart, the, the kind of, like, the nerdy hardware stuff for a second. But, so, you've got the Hero one. And then, mm-hmm. basically... From that point forward, every year, GoPro at the time, and still to this day, puts out new hardware every yeah, year. Every year. So there's always an upgrade cycle. Were you just basically, were you buying the new stuff every time it came out? And if so, why, why not? Yes, definitely. Because at the time, 1080p was amazing quality footage to us, right? We yeah. watch that stuff and like, dang. Yeah, I, I remember like the first really HD big. television was like discovering fire for the first time. Right. I mean, you know, you yeah. go to, from an SD like four three or three four aspect ratio to like a sixteen by nine. It's insane. You're like, whoa. Yeah, and, and big deal. And now I look back at that stuff and I cringe. And I'm like, yeah. oh, dude, I can't do anything with that right now. Yeah. Like, that looks like like something from the seventies. But at the time, I mean, YouTube had just they they started the. Basically, the hardware industry follows what the encoders are doing and what is capable from a delivery perspective over the current internet of the day. Right. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I've, so I've the hardware that. lags behind what the industry is capable of from a distribution standpoint. Totally. And we see that now with 4K. Yeah. Because when I first started shooting 4K, people would tell me I was wasting my time. Yeah. Like no one even has a 4K TV. Well, I, I, dude, I just watched a video on a guy that's a pretty well-respected photographer. And he's saying, like, don't even worry about 4K. Don't shoot in 4K. Just, like, it's overhead that you don't need for your system. But there's a lot of reasons to use 4K, to shoot 4K, from what I've learned, you know. Um, just watching all the different YouTube videos with people that actually know way more than I do about it. Um, one, we talked about, like, cropping. You know, like, in post, there's there's times when... Well, you, you explain it. Like, if you shoot, why, why shoot 4K? Well, with that higher resolution, I can crop and zoom in without sacrificing quality. It just really gives me a lot of wiggle room. Yeah, it's like, post. it's kind of like if you if you shoot a 4K or even a higher frame rate, if you, or size of resolution, if you can, it's all, it gives you in post, it gives you the ability to, you, to almost treat it as more than one camera, right? Because you can... You can do a, a wide establishing shot or crop in and zoom in. So it looks like you, you zoom in off the same piece of footage um, losslessly, basically. Yep. Uh, the other thing is if if you're in a situation where we were talking about this, where there's a landmark in the back that if people saw it, they'd know exactly where you were. You crop that shit out, right? A thousand percent. Yeah. Um, and still shots. Right? Yeah. We use, we, I utilize a ton of still shots. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. Video. Yeah. Because they're way better, they're they're great enough to you know to do it's a still. Eight megapixel quality out of a 4K video. <coughs> right. Um, okay, so you uh, GoPro at the time is dropping new hardware every every year, and they're just kind of like paced by whatever YouTube's capable of, and are and you're getting you're buying new GoPro equipment every time. New GoPro equipment, new batteries because you're changing the batteries. New SD cards. I remember. I'm looking at your 64 and 32 gigabyte SD cards in your case right there. Yeah, it, remembering with, that the heroes at the time couldn't even record to them. Yeah, and like not to mention how fast these are. This the read write on these oh, SD cards is crazy. Yeah, you know. Um, okay, and then 
you're getting new new GoPros every every year. Have you always been on GoPro since day one? I've experimented with a couple other brands. What other stuff have you used? I've used the Garmin Verb, and that's a good camera. What do you? Because it's is a main selling point like GPS metadata. That stuff's cool, but it's almost like too much data for me. Yeah, you know, what? As a fisherman, I don't want to share everything. This is at the end of yeah. the day, man. Like they don't need to know <laughs> like the right. GPS coordinates number one. Yeah, it's good for your personal use though you know to know right. where you were and stuff like that um i've gotten kind of just accustomed to the gopro um hardware yeah and just working around it when so back in the day like when you were when you were in the early days to say the gopro and when you're you're using youtube in the early days what did your post-production look like oh, you know in terms like of the that. editing what did you use for an editor and stuff oh, like gosh, that windows and media maker Wow. Okay. Because did it did like Final Cut Pro or Adobe? It was Adobe there, the Adobe Pro is it Premiere? But like that yeah. was stuff that only guys that I knew were, that were in like an industry, yeah, and doing videos professionally were using. Yeah. Because you needed like twenty thousand dollars workstations to right. to do anything. Yeah, it was way beyond my reach. Yeah. So I used free video editing, and there were no edits. It was pretty much raw footage, cast to catch, because that's a thing in our world. Right, Explain boy. that term. I've never heard that, that term. So in bass fishing, people have pretty much just been duped by marketing ploy after marketing ploy for decades. All right. You Hollywood these scenarios. They'll take fish out of a live well, pin it on a hook, let it swim out. They'll pretty much fake a catch for the sake of marketing or promoting whatever product. Yeah. Whether it's a trolling motor, a boat. Yeah. A there, so there's a... I was watching a, uh, there was a Steve Rinelli. Did I say his name right? Steve Rinelli? I think it's Rinelli. Rinelli. He was doing a, a, a break. There's this, there's this breakdown series of videos. They get professionals on and they'll break down like, you know, different scenes from movies or whatever. And they brought him on to break down, uh, basically hunting scenes. Right. And he, he's watching the hunting scenes. And he's like, I hate this shit. And, they, and he's, he's like, here, here's why. And he said like, that species of elk would not be in that forest. I know what that forest is, you know? And he said, the, these are all staged and I get why they do it for production reasons, but it's the same, it's a point you're making, right? It's just, there's no authenticity there. And the people that understand what the deal is, they all know. And then they're immediately undermined from day one. And there, there's a, uh, there was an article that the New York times put out about, I would say like, Six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, it was around the time that IFTD, International Fly Trackle Dealers Association, had their 2019 show. It was the week before it published, actually. And I read it, and I'm looking at the looking at the photos and reading the copy, and the fucking photos, dude, are just, it's that same kind of a situation. You, you just know by looking at the photos, all this shit's staged. So you look at the photos, and then you're now you're skeptical, and you read the article, and it just mm-hmm. confirms everything you already thought about the 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 whole body of work based on the photos. Absolutely, man. And it you know it's it's critically important. Like if you're gonna okay, so cast to catch is really around just showing the whole like chain of custody on That's things right. that it looks like literally from the cast. Yeah. To okay. Hitting the water to the fish biting to catching it, all uncut. Okay, and you still do that today? And we everything we document is yeah. really cast to catch. We don't show it that way because especially my style of filming. We're filming with multiple cameras, right? Mm-hmm. So I like cutting from different angles, but every single. But it, the continuity is there, though, right? Is still a cast to catch video. Yeah. So it's there. Yeah. Like, and it, it it's really important to show that authenticity to our market or our our audience. And when you say our audience, you're talking specifically about the bass trophy bass fishermen. Tro- okay. But I, guys, I think that apply that applies to pretty much any. It does. Right. Any kind of fishing context or any really any kind of, I don't know, hunting kind of context. Anything when you're dealing with wildlife is a yeah. factor. I feel. Yeah. You, it's hard to control nature. Right. Yeah. You got big budgets and you're you've got a timeline and, and a window of opportunity to capture content for some big marketing push. I yeah. can see how guys, you know, take take the easy route and and, and cheat, right? And, and what we call it, like hanging a bait. It's like you'll you'll notice in our videos, like guys won't even think about it. They'll go to take the bait that we just caught the fish off and hang it back in the fish's mouth 
for the shot. And I'm like, nah, man, we don't do that. Because we don't ever want anybody to get the idea that, that we ever do that. Yeah. So if it falls out of its mouth, whatever, cool. Just hang it on the rod and hold it up, you know, for that shot. You don't need to put the bait back in the fish's mouth. Every single shot you've seen on a big bass streams platform or my platforms, if that fish, if that hook was in its mouth, that's exactly how it came on the boat. Yeah. I mean, that's cool from like just on the fish too, right? You're not, you're not going to put another yeah. hole in the fish and rip its mouth apart more, less, more than you already have, you know? Yeah. It's tough, man, because, uh, I do this for a living, right? And it's all content yeah. generated, but at the same time, like very few people, if anybody cares more about these trophy fish than I do, because I mean, that's what drives this whole passion. Yeah. So there's this fine line. I got to walk especially with my team too, like, Hey, let's take care of the fish, but we need to get the shot. We need to get without compromising that fish's health and integrity and get it back in the water. But we've got, we've gotten a lot better at that. And we've been trying yeah. to be transparent in how we do that in the hopes that it's helping everybody that's trying to emulate what we're doing. I've always thought like bass were just these like, you know, M one Bradley tanks that you could just beat the piss out of. You yeah, could keep them fish. out. Uh, and I'm not saying I beat the piss out of bass when I catch them. I'm treat them like I do any any trout or, or salmon or, or steelhead or whatever. But they seem to be a lot more hardy than say a, a salmonid, right? Agreed. Um. So what is what are you guys doing? What what sort of like special care and treatment are you talking about then with with the bass? Is it just? Yeah, I mean, yeah, go. Yeah, it's it's really as simple as remembering that they don't breathe air. Yeah, that's a thing. tough one to remember. Right? So we're all <laughs> yeah. pumped up because we're human beings. Right? Yeah, we're, we're off. We're we're in this moment. We got this crazy dopamine rush. We're all freaking pumped with adrenaline, high fiving. Like, dude, we just caught a giant fish. Like, that's a special moment. Yeah, it's super easy to forget little things like, oh, that fish doesn't breathe there. So either get it in the live well, just get its gills in the water, whether it's boat side in the net in the live yeah. well. You can prep all your camera stuff in the meantime, minimize handling, just make sure they're upright in either the live well or the, or the net, and just be efficient, right? Get your shots all in one go and your video all in one go and then back in the water. Wow. Yeah, because you really, to capture that moment correctly, you have to, you know, you're doing the cast to catch shots first there so the cameras are set up orientation wise it sounds like one's on the console and there's s- i usually run four or five. Oh shit okay yeah. i want to talk about that in a second so <laughs> uh, close yeah there, so but basically you catch you guys do the cast to catch then you get the fish to hand then it's basically okay let's 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 now it's mo- even, let's get the now fish it's all in one motion all in one take all those things I talked about is yeah. all happening simultaneously. The cameras are being re- reset up no, or no? They're not because they're all running. So okay. They're capturing it. So real time fish either in the boat or in the net. And then yeah. as I'm pulling out, I'm saying whatever I need to say. I'm unhooking the fish. I'm holding it up and getting my shots. My guys on the boat already know the deal. They're taking stills if that's applicable. Or if I'm solo, I'm just going to count on that uh, video being in high resolution so I can pull the stills that I need from it. Yeah. Okay, so all the cameras are running, and so all your angles are covered all at the same time. Do you talk to me about how you start and stop your recording on a video? Because I've been struggling, like, trying to figure this out. Can you, for example, chain a bunch of GoPros together to work off a single push button remote? I've experimented with that with the actual GoPro remote, but I can Because I think they let you do it, right? Yeah, but I can never really get it to work how I wanted to. So the next best thing is turning the uh, audio like dictation um, on in all the cameras <coughs> and using like a one solid command and like okay. saying GoPro stop recording. Okay, so we're so all five of them will pick it up. So we're talking basically about uh, uh, heroes. What six and up? Is that yeah, when they? Is that when they started five. doing it? five? Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, so many, many generations between the time when you first got going and. Because I'd have to run around my boat and turn them Literally, off. like, like, like whack them all. Yeah. Because there have been so many dope sequences that I blew it on where yeah. I thought I turned it on and then I get this super sick shot and I turn to the camera all big old cheesy smile and the thing is not on. And I'm yeah, that's like, true. Ah, ah, ah. 
Okay. So you so you do use a voice command zone big time. Thousand percent. Yeah, and they are they they work pretty well. Eighty percent of the time. Eighty. It's not windy. It, it just mm. you got to make sure all of them can pick you up. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because they're all facing different directions. Yeah, I, I thought I read something where if you have GoPros and they're all the same model, same software version, that you can chain them together off of a single remote. Mm. So, like, you would just have it on your belt clip or something, hit record, and they could all just fire up and go. But see, that's another thing i got to deal with. Yeah, right? the remote. Yeah. Okay. And, well, yeah. there's a remote, I can literally just scream into the freaking air. Right, right. And they, they usually work. Okay. The only other time i got to worry about that is if the wind is up. Yeah. Or if you get, like, a lot of boat traffic noise. Or uh, what's the other scenario that I was trying to think of? There's only a certain couple angles you want to save. Mm-hmm. So I almost go to like each one that I want to save. Like I'll go to my console or my port side and almost whisper to that one. <laughs> go, bro, stop and, and this is just to save SD storage and Correct. battery? Yeah, and just file okay. management. Because you remember at the end of the day, I still got to scrub every... Yeah, camera. it's just a shit look. Yeah, yeah I want to I want to talk about that in a, in a bit, but... Um, and I have to do it every night because I don't want to forget. See, oh just, my God. That's the thing. Like, I think people don't understand if they haven't shot an edited video and published <laughs> video on YouTube. You have to, how you have much, to wear all those hats. How too. much fucking work it, oh it is, gosh. man. It's just so much work. It's a, so for like a minute of content, how many hours and posts do you think you, you spend? Uh, between the backing up and for an, Man, I had it worked out pretty well at one point. This is when I was a little bit less efficient. It was almost like an hour per minute. It yeah. was even longer the further back in time you went. Yeah, and every camera you add, I assume, is going to add more time because that's just one other angle and thing you need to consider during your edit, mm-hmm. right? And I'm trying to remember which which angle would have been the money shot. Yeah. Were you, so prior to GoPro, I assume you were just using a one camera setup. Yeah, it was like that one setup. Okay, and then, and then the, the, that old, the first GoPro comes out, and then did you immediately start going to two cameras? I, my second camera was a Hero 2. Okay. So that happened as that new generation came in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Still a one, one setup, or did you go two at that point? I was two, yeah. So you yeah. just kind of got them based on when the new ones are out, and you just kept the old one in the, in the in the rotation yeah, also and leveraging my ability to to build on everything that i've been working on right yeah yeah I've yeah been, i've been self-funded from the beginning yeah and i cool. grew it from nothing yeah so it's been organically growing yeah right like everything that i use everything that i that i own has been a reinvestment into what i'm trying to do here and that's yeah. better share this content that i'm capturing with the audience yeah and then Okay, but it's a shitty, it's a shitty game to play, man. Because like I'll never catch up. It yeah. doesn't seem that way. You so you're just basically you're adding new cameras, and what's the what, what's the sweet spot for the number of cameras on the boat? Where you where where have you landed with all the all the investment and time and just on the boat? You know, laying it out. You know, what what's the where where does their diminishing returns kick in on camera number of cameras on the boat? See, now there's this really one big factor that really determines that. And that's whether or not you have a dedicated shooter on the boat. To explain. So if you got a full-time camera guy holding a camera whose job is to do nothing but shoot, that changes the dynamic. Is that... Uh, yeah, how so? Because my number of, like, GoPros can drop. Because if he's doing his job... You have a human... To, got a human to reframe what you need correct but you can't always count on the human because like we all need breaks we all get distracted and what we do happens in yeah that fast of a moment so it's even then i still have gopros running as a supplementary backup almost because it never fails every time we got a big shoot right we're doing like a wire to fish shoot we're we're shooting a reality show that we had or we're shooting any high production piece like even uh dos boat as soon as those guys swap a battery out it's like murphy's law that's when it's gonna happen yeah like every freaking time so you can't ever really get away from the gopros in my opinion 
they're just kind of there for an insurance policy almost. Right. And for yeah. me, they've been really my main main source of, of shooting. Because <coughs> well, a lot of times I'm solo. There were, I, I did see like a few times when the on the DOS boat series, because I watched the whole thing, which was awesome. Um, I think I was watching the Texas one where they, they had some wide shots where they were using, it looked like GoPro 7s, Hero 7s on, yeah. the, on the deck. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And then they also had obviously some probably shot with red red cameras or something. But um, yeah, they're still using that. Even in the, these big productions, still use them because you get those really interesting, quick, like two second, three second hyper yeah, quick cuts just super dope perspectives that you wouldn't yeah. get otherwise you can mount a little tiny gopro camera in you know really creative places yeah and show something that people haven't seen in that fashion before yeah. i think that's really cool when did you um when did you move to more of what would people would call like a more professional kind of like editing setup software wise like a, a final cut pro or adobe premiere or something so I like how long ago? all those free options, right? I went from Windows Media Maker yeah. to, I finally upgraded to a MacBook. I forgot what generation this was. So you're on a Mac platform today then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my, my first MacBook might have been like 2013 or something. Yeah, that's about me too, around yep. the same time. So obviously that was iMovie, all right? And for a free you know, for, for for being free, it was actually quite efficient in what I needed it to do, especially if you're just Dude, an Instagram edit. For 99% of the population, it's more than adequate. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's free with Mac OS, right? Bundle, I believe. I so. Yeah, I think it is. Pretty sure. Yeah, so you don't need a Final Cut Pro or an Adobe Premiere to share content if your content is cool enough. If you're shooting unique, high-quality content, I think that should be strong enough to stand on its own legs without any production value. Because yeah. Because we've gotten this far. Yeah. And off of that premise. Let, let's like take a little tangent for a second because this is what you're talking about. We talked about over dinner. Yeah. And talk about the project where you just spent a shit ton of time on your production and the edit and just obsessed over it. And you're like, the shit's not even near as engaging as like half the stuff we've shot in, you know, with one fifth of the time and even less budget. Like, Talk about that for a second. Yeah, man. So, number one, I'm known to be pretty hard-headed and stubborn. And I want to paint my interpretation of fishing in this light that really does it justice, at least to me. But I've had to really bite my tongue and sacrifice a lot of my own personal values as far as, like, quality of the content to grow the platforms to a point where I feel like they could then sustain my level of quality. Mm -hmm. And I see that in some of my colleagues, like Brandon Polinick is one of the world's best bass fishermen. He fishes on one of the top tours in the world. He won't sacrifice that quality. So his frequency of posting to his YouTube channels much more infrequent but he keeps his production value very high, which I am very envious of. Like I wish I could do that with the big bass stream channel and my own channel now, but seeing it firsthand that that doesn't translate to growth. So it's our, it's like an ROI decision. It really is man. Yeah. And it's tough because I can't justify the return on investment because there is none on that high production. Cause we've, like I said, we've done high hot. We've had an entire Hollywood production team traveling with us for six weeks straight throughout middle America shooting our reality show. Like we've got to do that on somebody else's dime. Mm-hmm. Right. And just shoot something really cool. Uh, the highest production value. And then we've done stuff with like DOS boat. We've done stuff with uh, be live media And it's crazy because I would think, man, this really reflects more of what I wish we were putting out on a daily basis instead Mm -hmm. of what you guys see on those platforms now. And it doesn't translate to engagement. It's kind of strange. And I don't know if it's a generational (coughs) thing. Yeah, we, we, we talked a bit about it, right? And there was the, there was the, the, the polish, there's like two axes, basically. There's the amount of polish and production value that you put into content. 
and then someone's trust in the content. If you're the premise is that if the content's more polished, that means that there's a big brand behind it and they're trying to sell me something. So therefore I'm going to be a little more guarded in my acceptance of that, that content. Right. And there's, there's kind of like this fine line and it seems like because people are bombarded with different marketing messages, um, sometimes, you know, under the guise of a, of, of, of entertainment, like most stuff is sold these days that, there's just an inherent kind of their hackles are already up. Their spidey sense is already tingling. They're mm-hmm. waiting for you to like try and sell, sell you something. Um, maybe that's why. Yeah. I can I definitely see that dynamic coming into play. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with that other than like the, with the, um, yeah, it was bad. It's basically just back to the ROI. It's like the level of effort required to produce content as it is just even decent content and then if you put the extra polish on it and the extra production work and maybe you add that extra camera that shoots like, you know, a red camera or whatever is it like really worth the investment. It sounds like no, especially when you said earlier tonight about the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm. And can you talk a bit about that? You know, I'm, I'm honestly pretty ignorant to exactly how that algorithm works and how much it's changing. I mean, everybody is, but like, what is your intuition telling you? Man, I can just speak on my personal experience. Yeah. Every time we don't have a video going up literally every day, we can see a dramatic drop in our engagement and views yeah. and growth. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're chasing the dragon on a daily basis, it's really tough to have a high level of production quality and also with that kind of frequency, right. you know, the post. And, and we're trying not to flood people's feed with just crap. Yeah. Like we post every day, but I feel good with like every single video we're posting, especially if you've been watching the last four or five months. Like, man, we've captured some dope, dope stuff across genres, across species. And uh, we've, we've, we've tried to tiptoe that fine line of as high a production value as we can justify. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the content strong enough to stand alone, we feel, and be impactful. Because we're fishing public water all the time for hard-to-capture fish. And if you're truly a passionate angler, you should be able to relate to all of that at some level. Yeah, I mean, that that's an important point that you make, and I want to gloss over it because this idea of, like, fishing public water and still having the success you do is pretty special because you're getting, you know, it's it's pressured water. It's just like the big game hunters, right? I think Rogan yeah. talks about this in his one of his podcasts I where, and- yeah, dude, and it's the same sort of a situation. If you're, if you're going into green-filled pasture, that doesn't get fished a lot, of course you're going to bang fish because they just don't see stuff. They're not as schooled. So, yeah, what you guys are doing is pretty cool, especially in light of that rule around only fishing public stuff. I think people get lost in the importance of context in the fishing world because I feel context matters. Give give me, like, a concrete example of what you're talking about. Yeah, The easiest one is as clear as black and white, and it's public water and private water for the exact same scenario you just described right Mm -hmm. and here's a really simple analogy that most of my guy friends get (laughs) going to go fish a private bass fishery that kicks out big fish and gloating about it because i'm sure it's fun i'm sure it's rewarding but you can't it'd be the, the same thing as you going to the strip club and leaving the strip club thinking that you've got real game with the women there Wait a that second. She really liked you, man. She but, really, really liked me. Oh, man. I'm t- taking this a little personal right now, <laughs> Oliver. <laughs> um, it's not the same no, thing. I, I got you. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I'm sure it's fun, but you can't go around like talking about your PB being from the strip club. It's just not a good look. Yeah. And it's all in context. So when you tell me that you fish a public water like Lake Fork, Texas, or Gunnersville in Alabama, or just about every lake in California, or Mille Lacs in Minnesota. Anything that gets a lot of pressure and you've caught a big fish, like, dude, that's that's an accomplishment because those fish are literally seen it all. 
and the dumb ones have been caught and the big ones have probably been caught and released and are less likely to slip up and make that mistake. So that context is everything. Yeah. Okay. That's a super important point. And then, so how do you, how do you explain, how do you set context with a video? What do you guys, what are some of your methods for doing that? Is it just like a wide establishing shot? Yeah, it's probably almost uh, the same strategy that Disney employed with the last Star Wars movie, right? And just giving it to you in the in the opening. Of the, they go, hey, Palpatine's back. This is what's happening. Oh, God. <laughs> and we just got to spell it out for him. I, I need to relive that horror again. <laughs> Thanks, dude. You're welcome. Oh, man, we were talking about that tonight, too. It's tough, man, because you guys are talking about uh, the attention span over dinner as well, right? I only got their attention for so long until I lose them. Yeah. So I can't paint out this super elaborate story without them just signing off before I get to the point. And it's it's a tough day and age I feel like I got to deal with because I think less and less people are willing to sit through, like, an hour nature documentary by David Attenborough. And really just soak in like how magnificent of a story visually and and just overall that a production like that brings. And said they'd watch some, you know, and I hate to say it because there are some of these guys that follow what I do, but I feel like they've kind of taken the easy road by doing like a Walmart challenge to grow their YouTube channels, or right? or just going down like what I call the corny route. And becoming like a sideshow. Like gimmicky kinds Super of stuff. gimmicky, right? Challenge this, challenge that. How about you just go try doing hard to do shit challenge? Like impactful challenge. Let's do the impactful challenge. Let's let's get beyond. And it sucks, man, because I almost have to play that clickbait game to a degree. But I'll never lie to the audience. Right, but I, I I almost still have to play the thumbnail game and the clickbait game and the well, title just to get them to click on it. Talk about thumbnails and titles for a second, because there's people probably wondering what the heck you're talking about. Well, those are two big driving factors to your YouTube channel. How so? Because those are the first two of the first things they see pop up in their suggested feeds as soon as they're done watching another video. That column on the right of all those videos in queue and people tend to want to appeal to that clickbait, right? And that clickbait could be a visual uh, highlighted video just, or a title, right? Fish eats man or like just something absurd, but it's so absurd. Now, you know it's probably not real, but you got to click it anyway. The most insane thing you'll ever <sighs> see in 2020. Right. Yeah, man, it's it sucks. Yeah, and it's it's like this constant... Because I watch a lot of YouTube. I, I watch a ton of YouTube videos, and it's mm-hmm. mostly around educational stuff. But, you know, whether I'm... Like, I've said this on the show before. That's how I learned audio engineering, you know. And I, I know just enough audio engineering to do the task that I'm trying to do. But when I... Um, decided to buy my first spinning rod which was recently and to you know take it out for drift fishing float fishing or whatever i had no clue where to even start from the ground up nothing Which channel did you watch um the fish fishing addicted fishing is that hey those are my boys yeah shout out to addicted yeah they're uh they're their stuff's like not high production quality not great audio but it's good enough. They, I think they recently like started using lab mics. So that's awesome. So their audio has gotten better, but some of their older stuff, you know, as like everybody else, they're evolving. Everybody's evolving. And you know, I'm throwing stones because I don't really, we don't really have a YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is basically all of our audio content being automatically, you know, split over to YouTube. So one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about how you're running your show is like this year, 2020, we're going to be doing some, you know, high end fly fishing uh, or fly fly tying videos and you've seen a little bit of the studio so it gave me some feedback which has been awesome so the, the point i was trying to make is like you know to find addicted to finally land on the addicted fly fishing guys or the the, the addicted stuff for what i was trying to do i had to scan through a lot of titles 
and thumbnails uh-huh. to get there and finally finding plays what, game well. what I wanted. Yeah, and they, they do. And there's definitely like an art to it and it kind of depends what I'm what I'm reading is that it depends on what category you're in. All right. Is you know how you construct it, but there's like this guy Peter McKenna. You know he's a he's a photographer. He's huge on YouTube, like four and a half million followers. He's big. Um, he he did a whole segment on on this topic, and he says like sometimes he'll take longer to think about the the title the title and the thumb than it took to produce the content, which blows my mind. See, and that's sad. And there's it's almost a science. Like people are doing A B split tests and all kinds of crazy shit to figure it all out. And it's it's very similar to like back in the old days when they used to write, you know, well, they still do it in the blog world and everything else online. It's the same thing with news. Like if you look at news titles and, you know, the, the first like 20 lines of the description, it's meant because everybody's vying for the same click, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately, it kind of is almost just as important as the the content, you know, in terms of getting people to engage in what it is you're doing. And I think what you guys are doing is kind of elevating, looking past all that and saying, Hey, look, if you're going to subscribe to our channel, it's going to be on the merit of the channel and not me trying to fucking game the system. Just that's my only hope. Yeah. Because I, I think it's a good, games. I, I think, um, I think one of the reasons podcasts are taking off and getting traction is because of that authenticity. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think that at the end of the day, Pete, there's, you know, we're getting lied to a lot and people are looking for stuff they can trust. I I honestly do believe that. Um, And that's why I think, I think you're on the right track, man. I really, I really do. And I think obviously we're, I'm in this and we're in this as a group with everybody I work with. We're in this for the long haul. Like I'm I'm not looking for some short term reward. Uh, Well, clearly you've been doing it forever. Yeah. I mean, you're one of the OGs of the YouTube, Which is, especially in the fly, in the fishing world, especially, right? Well, in trophy bass fishing, maybe. Yeah. Because I definitely slept on that platform. So let's go back to the beginning of this podcast, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So YouTube started as a way for me to circumvent Facebook pulling my videos down because of the music I was using. We oh, the digital music. rights management stuff. So yeah. I could upload that same exact <laughs> clip to YouTube and then paste the YouTube link to facebook and it that's circuit. all i used uh, it for for like years and then come like 2016 or something i'm at a buddy's house and he's got his buddy over and he's spilling his beans to me about his aspirations of growing this youtube empire and dude i was ignorant of all of this discussion and i'm like what are you talking about it's like oh you don't know this that and this guy i'm like no should i like what do they do are they tour level pros are they trophy hunters no man they're fishing youtubers and i'm like a what f is a fishing youtuber and that's really when i became aware (laughs) of what some of these guys are doing on that space and i was like they're doing what and they have how much of an audience doing what like and i was honestly kind of perplexed by it so i just spent the next six to 12 months just kind of like sitting back and paying more attention to that platform when I really should have been mobilizing on it more uh, because I was already shooting content. But I was also coming from a place where, you know, I'm a fisherman at the end of the day, first and foremost. And the things I've learned, I've learned the hard way, man, through self-sacrifice, an incredible amount of money and time spent trying to be better at what I do. I didn't really understand the value or didn't see a value at the time of just giving up the goods for what for YouTube fame. I mean, regardless of the money that they were generating, cause I've never been driven by money. Yeah. I just need the money to buy this dope audio setup that I'm staring at that you're using. Cause I need to up my audio game, right? That's, that's all it is. I need that as a resource to help bring my vision to light and life. Like I want to bring that David Attenborough yeah. level production to everything I yeah, would do. It, that it, takes money. And it's what's going on in the industry is just that stuff's getting smaller and it's getting more capable essentially. Right. Like 
what you know what with that and with that in mind what's what's in your gear bag today like what do you you can't you you came here you're you don't we don't have a camera i'm gonna shoot most of the video next tomorrow and, and the, the well tomorrow um let's say you're solo you brought it your solo setup right yeah pretty much, pretty much. i tried so, to get a couple of my local boys but they're already booked yeah. like isc's this week i didn't even realize that oh uh, so that ate up a bunch of my resources and I and the guys I had at home that were willing to travel with me. Pretty much this is too short a notice because we just kind of sprung this trip. Yeah. Uh, we, we were able to make it work, thankfully. Uh, but, yeah, it's really just a handful of GoPros. And I used to carry, you know, a nice DSLR. I've carried some Lumix cameras. I've carried this, that, and a third. But at the end of the day, I still need to focus on hard-to-do shit like catch a big-ass striped bass tomorrow. Yeah. And do it successfully. So I need a system that is pretty much uh, self-sufficient, right? Once I set it up, turn it on, it's good to go. Like yeah. I can go back to focusing on catching a big ass fish. And basically, because of the because of the voice activation in, in those systems, you, it's basically just sitting there passively waiting for you to say uh, record that or whatever the, right. the command is. So, what's in your bag exact, exactly? So I've got one new Hero Eight which is the latest generation. Mm-hmm. So that's become my vlog camera. I've been using the linear uh, aspect or, or, or a feature. For and that, so that linear is more of like a cinematic Correct. traditional, what you'd see on a 16 by nine. Absolutely. No so fish. Kind of getting that DSLR look without the complexities of having this giant DSLR. Yeah. That much more space in my one bag that I brought. Yeah. Right, so very heavy bag, by the way, and it's still extremely heavy. Yeah, yeah, because it's packed to the brim. Yeah, and that's just the basics, like that's bare minimum. So I've got three Hero Sevens that we're going to be placing throughout your boat tomorrow to cover uh, console side, port side, and one on the bow facing back at us. But I've also brought one of the new GoPro Maxes, and we've been experimenting that with that back to my trip to Australia a month ago, and. That shoots 360 degrees. So we're going to mount that right above your console. And that's the max? Mm-hmm. Why do you use the 360 camera? A uh, couple reasons. You got the flexibility of using 360 footage if you wanted to. But more than every, more than anything, for me, it's that over-capture feature. So I can actually go into post and actually pan through my 360 footage like it's one singular GoPro. Yeah. So explain... So there might be a sequence where a giant striper tomorrow comes up and eats a topwater just out of frame of those other three cameras. But with that overcapture, I can pan right to that. Okay, so you're using a 360 camera to cover the blind spots in your GoPro. Then that's a new. That's, that's not your primary camera, though. No. You just That's your insurance policy right. to cover everything. But it could be your primary if you can get it to, you know run all day that's your okay so it's a power issue for you uh the power you can hard uh hard hard power yeah hard wire it's because the 360 because i have an insta 360 over there the, okay so i okay. played with insta 360 and we've got some like 360 footage of, like rooster fish eating yeah water. my the promise of it is that you just have a single fucking camera you put it dead center in the console until your buddy's standing right next to it and all you got is a shot of his nuts yeah right I see. That happens a lot. Right. You can never count on any one camera, man. I'm telling you, something's going to happen. Oh, man. I, I thought I thought it, we had a like a solution. Nope, not going to work. Okay. Um, explain, for those people that don't know what the heck a 360 camera is, like, explain. Explain So it. it's literally a GoPro camera with a lens on both sides of the camera. Facing and in opposite directions. That's right. And it's stitching together those two video files. In real time. In real time. So it looks like if you were to flatten it out, it looks like if you remember those old old flat photos of the world, of the globe. Right. That's a lot what the, the footage looks like if it's flattened. So I think the first like pop culture use of that that I remember was that Kendrick Lamar mu- uh, music video for, uh, gosh, what was that? Humble? Okay. It's got him like riding a bike and it's got that weird distorted like yeah. fishbowl. Yeah. Like yeah. view. That's what the that is. small world or view so or whatever yeah, it's so called. You can zoom all the way out Tiny to planet. get that effect. 
or you can even zoom all the way in. Mm -hmm. Almost kind of like what we were talking about, like cropping with that 4K video. Yeah. To zoom in on stuff. And you can see that stuff in the Bear Money videos that we're posting to the Big Bass Streams channel now. You can see where we're using the GoPro Max or GoPro Studio software in post to switch between angles and perspectives all from that one part. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's what's that's what's cool about it. I think the the coolest thing about it is that you can completely recompose re re reframe the shot off of a single file. Mm -hmm. Like however you want to And you can do it multiple ways off the yeah. same file. Yeah. And because you have control over the pitch, yaw and the there's there's a third axis, I forget what it's called. I always forget the pitch, yaw, roll. Mm, that's right. There's pitch, yaw and roll in a spatial recorded thing and it's it's crazy and there's 360 degrees or angles that you can put yeah. the put the axis on essentially yeah. so, so they're getting better those cameras are getting much better they are more capable the stitching software is getting really really solid and and there's just improvements from the first generation which i just sold on ebay uh and, you know, the first generation utilized two SD cards. So the front camera would save to one card. The back camera would save to the other one. I literally have done nothing with Because they files. couldn't stitch in, in camera at the time, right? It was right. That, That's the issue. Yep. But now there's software, the hardware that's on the, on the camera mm -hmm. allows it to stitch in real time. It just makes it that much easier for a dummy like me to just get in there and actually do something with yeah. it. Yeah. And, okay, so we talked about 360 cameras quite a bit. Um and then another nice supplementary camera that I've really started to embrace, and I used to hate it, is the chest camera. Really? That the, gives you like the some, chest harness? Yeah, it gives you okay. some form of a point of view. Mm -hmm. And it, I hate it as a primary camera because it's just too weird Bla or Blair Witch Project for me. It's just yeah. too all over the place. But you can cut from it for little little segments to add a little different perspective. It almost acts as a really good secondary mic. Because the uh, audio on the off the reel and stuff, GoPros have been pretty good. Five and six are trash. trash. Okay, so you currently, even today in your production, you guys don't use any any audio soft any uh, dedicated dedicated audio capture hardware. Correct. I can't justify the extra. like a lav mic. No. And I got them. I brought a couple. Yeah. But can I justify taking that much more time? to set that up, to manage that extra file, and then manage that extra file in post. Yeah. And now I can't. Because you have to basically sync up your audio yeah. with the video. And because the, the, two, the two hardware platforms are typically independent of each other. That's right. And so, you're talking about four to ten hours of footage that I'm having. Yeah, it's just a, night, Dude, yeah, no it's a nightmare. There's no way. Yeah. And, you know, there's a... this. The G, the DGI what is it the Osmo mm -hmm. that this audio setup I'm going to show you tomorrow um, might be something that you could consider, nice. but um, the wire you know we use for the on the waters the people that listen to the show a lot um, they know that we use a Rode Wireless Goes which you know Rode puts out which we're recording this particular episode on um, normally we use a Rodecaster Pro in studio. But when we do, when we're out in the water, we use these these wireless go units. They're you know they're tiny. Yep. They're idiot proof to set up. They auto pair when they're going, and they put that to the test. Yeah, dude. And the, and the battery life. What? Where are we on the batteries on these so far on the transmitter and the receiver? Oh gosh, we're not even like a, a quarter. Yeah. So they've been they've been cooking along, and then all this feeds into uh, XLR and puts into a Zoom Six recorder. Um, XLR is just basically an audio jack, big, big, fat one. Um, yeah. No, the, the the audio quality's definitely been on my radar to tackle. Yeah. Up to this point, it doesn't meet that threshold. I feel like it's yeah. worth that investment. In time. Yeah, I I think like for me personally, because I've watched just a shit ton of of instructional videos and just fishing videos in general. Um, I think. It depends on the type of video, right? If you're right. doing like instructional stuff for fishing, I think the audio quality is kind of critical to it do. Um, and, and also just the, maybe a little more polished production stuff. Stream side's cool though too. I like I like watching stream side instructional videos and a lot of the the uh, addicted fishing guys. A lot of their stuff, you know, they shoot some in studio, 
but they do a lot of in-stream just on the on the water stuff too that's sure. really cool you know where they yeah, put I like it to try to do that kind of content in the moment yeah when i feel like it's you know really yeah. relevant yeah because we're gonna um shoot a little video tonight with of you kind of like setting up your rods yeah. i think right i think that'd be cool yeah my guys love it you know, seeing what I bring on these trips, like yeah, you know, I wonder what you thought. Well, it's cool, man, because you you came out of you came out of the Jet Blue terminal and and uh, your your rod tube's like fucking ten feet tall. I'm like, wait a second, uh, this thing your rods. I thought like fishing poles. Do you call them fishing poles? Is that the deal? Yeah, Is that the rods. right term? Fishing, fishing rod. Okay, yeah. your fishing rods break. I thought they all broke down, and I didn't expect it to be. You said it was like nine six or something. Uh, the tube itself is just under nine. Most yeah. of my rods are in the eight foot range. Eight, okay. Yeah, it was They're just, all one piece. It looks like a bazooka, though. Oh, I get looks for sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's gonna be real fun to go fish with you tomorrow and watch you and Nick slay. Um, all right. So what? Do we, what else do we cut? So the YouTube. What do you use for your video editor today? Do you use like Final Adobe Cut, Premiere. Adobe Premiere? Yeah. Why? Uh, it, it was honestly not that difficult to learn, at least as far as the basics. Yeah. Uh, I can't really justify spending any more time learning that yeah. software either. I've learned enough to get by to bank on the strength of my content. At least that's what I'm hoping on, right? I yeah. don't need to, to wow people with flashy title intros and transitions. You should be wowed by the fucking fish you just saw me freaking winch to the boat. Yeah. Like that's what should wow you. Not everything else. Not the stupid thumbnail. Not the stupid clickbait title. Like, watch what I just did and understand the context under which I did it. Yeah. But maybe that's putting too much on the audience. Dude, I don't know, man. I, know, I mean, man, you got a pretty good YouTube following. You're doing something, right? I think it's doing okay. But like, here's here's my point to anybody aspiring to, to, to go down this path. Like, if you're cool with selling your dignity and <laughs> and your soul in the name of YouTube fame, just understand that, like, when you talk to a new OG like we are in our space, like, attention is not, is not the same thing as respect. Because yeah. I will respect somebody that has stayed true to themselves and not achieved this weird perception of success and fame, especially in this YouTube front. Yeah, it, it's a trip. Like they're the the um, what our culture is put deeming as valuable. Like right. social currency is deemed as valuable in terms of you know just just getting engagement from people is valuable yeah. because it's just a way to monetize content. You know, I I don't know. It's just it's interesting. It is interesting, and it, I'm trying to be better, not being the bitter old man because I find yeah. myself being that dude as a. <laughs> Way too often. It's cool to see. It's it's just it's fun to watch all this shit though, and and be just kind of a student of it, and be able to talk to guys like you that have had success in it, and understanding like what what's how to do it and what what's going on. Um, with can you talk about um, your hardware? Like, what do you what do you edit your videos on and stuff like at, at your office or whatever? So I've been on a threshold of potentially upgrading to that new iMac that just came out the pro yeah but I can't. the the, I'm, the iMac pro like the desktop okay mm -hmm. okay but I, I just can't justify that right now because that investment can go towards some other projects that we're and that's on. also you know you're talking about thirty five hundred dollars and up oh, pretty much they're just that more. By the time yeah I upgrade it. yeah the workstation <laughs> you're probably looking for you sixty five hundred yeah I'm guessing easy and even if I yeah. really wanted to go for it and here's my personality if you see what if you if you follow my content and and just see my personality, like if I'm gonna go three quarters of the way, f it, I'm just gonna go all the way. Yeah. You can see that in my little boat project because it started with with <laughs> with the intention of being like a bare bones like aluminum boat, and it turned into like this thirteen thousand dollar like ridiculous blinged out dopest boat I own. That's funny. And. Yeah, so like I'm gonna take that approach in everything that I do. So I'm yeah. the best, right? Like, well, actually, but with you know, with respect to what you're doing in post, you know, we talked earlier in this episode about a minute of content is an hour of post. 
So you that's a that's like a a thing you got to think about in the ROI on that hardware. Yeah, if I can reduce my render time by X, you know, renders being like when you do your edit and you export all that video, how fast that machine gets that project that thing done so you can move on to the next thing that that's you right. need to do in your workflow is is critical. So when, you know, we talk about $6500 hardware that's that's kind of like the re- reality of why you'd want to do that yeah. your your average person that doesn't need a sixty five hundred dollar machine but you know it's like a tool right you, you know if you're a carpenter you're gonna get you know you, you you probably yeah you could go to the flea market and get like an air ratchet uh air driven nail gun or whatever but you know they got What's they, guy's efficiency they have lithium one? lithium battery stuff now that's maybe more expensive, but does a much better job. But yeah, efficient. It comes down to efficiency. Mm-hmm. So, so you're using, you said Adobe Premiere. So I, got, uh, and, I forgot whatever the biggest iMac uh, was at the time, and that uh, you can upgrade it anymore. Yeah, I think that was a 2017. Yeah, and I've got a, a one big monitor as a, I, I use as a secondary monitor when I'm editing, so I can keep. You know, all my uh, windows with all my different files with every GoPro angle, right? Everything, and right? Cascades. Okay, okay. So I can drag and drop into my Adobe Premiere timeline. And work <laughs> so your entire, your entire like media library for that particular project's in your left wa- monitor. Correct. Yeah, okay. And then um, you, you have editors also that you work with, production assistants that you work with also, but it yeah, sounds like you're still you. pretty hands-on too, though. Yeah, but for the yeah. most part, it's still mostly me. Yeah. And it's getting to that point now where it's starting to free me up to where I can focus on promoting my own branded channel. Yeah. And Big Bass Streams as a channel can go back to, or finally get to the point where it was intended to be a, more, a community resource. Because that, that brand is not Oliver and I it's right. it's all the other people involved with that movement and it should yeah. be their space as well as mine so that's you're still cool. going to see a healthy dose of me on there but what you see on that platform versus what you see on my platform will be two different things like I'm starting to start to I'm starting to dive into the podcast world a little bit but this is totally new to me so for now, I'm just shooting vlog stuff mm-hmm. and calling it a podcast, but it's long form, 40 to 60 minutes and uh, discussions with some pretty dope, influential people that I, I get. to. Yeah, know, that's right? cool. So, yeah. I mean, we talked about this a bit, um, but like, it's kind of like what April's Vokey's doing where she's traveling around, but all her stuff's audio, but you're like, you're out there, you're, you're traveling around everywhere you're meeting really interesting people get, along the way i get to hang like, out and fish it, with and talk dude, with some dope people it just makes sense to do it and you I, know and up until this point i'm like well f it i'm just gonna turn the cameras on and yeah. capture this organic conversation yeah. anyway yeah yeah yeah. because that's those are the conversations i'd want to sit in on all right and yeah. people have expressed to me like a ton that they wish they could sit in on some of these conversations i have with some of these people yeah and then the ones that have actually navigated and found their way to my new channel and watch that stuff have, you know, you know, hit it, hit us or hit me back with some really good feedback. Yeah. When, um, so when you're, you've got a project, you're done with a project, talk about your storage. How do you, how do you manage your, your file systems and stuff it's like that? It's much the same way as the raw files. It's saved on a hard drive, redundant copy. Uh, do, you, do you use cloud offsite also? Uh, no, I haven't found a good solution. Do you have a like a, a NAS or a network attack storage? How do you? No, man, it's beyond. No. Me. It's as simple. As oh just shit! Having, you haven't you had know. a major. You you have lost data then in, under your roof. It sounds like. No. Yeah, dude. Not yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, I learned to keep like a copy of my archives at another location in the case of something catastrophic mm-hmm. happening. I learned that from my day job, right? Mm-hmm. So they back up all our office files for all those construction mm-hmm. projects offsite mm-hmm. once a week, yeah. and uh, yeah, I've, I've that's about as far as I've dove into that. Yeah, we uh, we've got a little net like a we have a, a four four disc array with it's basically a little network attack storage device over Thunderbolt three, so it's got high I/O on the on the read write. 
So we can put our, all of our project files are going to go on the NAS directly. So you don't utilize any of the, you know, the storage, local storage on the, on the machine. And then, um, it'll, I, I'm trying to figure out how to basically make it at the, at night sync up to like Dropbox okay. for offsite storage just automatically. Like when we're not, when it's not being used, yeah. it'll just take a snapshot of whatever's on the network attached storage and dump it up to Dropbox. That's the plan, but it's in a raid six. So what that means is like any one of those four bays goes down, they're redundant data. So if one goes down, you know, if there's a catastrophic failure and one or two go down, I can put in brand new hard drives into the NAS and the other two will basically rebuild the other two that were just introduced into the, into the box. So it's, you know, it's not, not cheap to do it, but it's like we're this content that we're going to be producing is like, you know, you know, there's a lot of time and investment that goes into it. And it's like part of the intellectual property and you got to treat it like it's going to go into the bank vault That's essentially. Right. right. That's how I treat all my content. Cause yeah. that's my ability within my means anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But the, this stuff's getting, this stuff's getting more and more affordable. Like this NAS that I'm talking about is for a setup like that is around 1500 bucks. Okay. With, you know, all in pretty much, but you're going to, there, there's a bit of a learning curve to set it up, to configure it. But you know, that, that system that I just talked about was like five, $6,000, just like five years ago. Wow. So they, they're coming down. Everything, all the technology is coming down in price. You can do more capability with less money. And it's a smaller footprint also, you know. That's big. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we have everything. We have all the hardware ready to go and everything in the studio set up. We just have, we're going to just start recording these videos now here pretty soon. See, I pretty much came from the opposite approach. Yeah. We've well, just been winging it, man. I'm a nerd. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a total nerd. So, but it's been, it's been cool. It's been a really fun learning experience, you know, and something I'm into. And that's why I want to do the bonus episode with you because yeah. we're just starting to get into this. And, um, you know, I, I figure there are other people that would maybe get some utility out of it. Hopefully. Hey, and here's something I've learned, man. You can never shoot too much content. That's a solid point. You really can never do that. Okay, so let's talk about the future and then we'll wrap this thing up because I know we're getting it's getting late and I need to relax and go to sleep for a bit, maybe watch a movie. But where do you think where do you think what's YouTube look like in 5 years? What does the fishing industry look like in 2 years through the lens of say YouTube or another, you know, big content channel? And what does the hardware look like in 2 to 5, you know, 3 to 5 years out? What do you think is going to happen? What I hope will happen is there will be a balance to the force over the next two to five years in this fishing realm to where impactful, meaningful content rises back up to the top. And that is always going to withstand the test of time, withstand trends, withstands uh, what we're living through now and having to just navigate through a bunch of subpar content. Because people don't know the difference most of the time. They, they just haven't been around long enough, especially people that are new to the fishing space. And there's a lot of it. I mean, there's a lot of new growth, which is a, which is a great thing for the fishing world. Yeah, and conservation. Absolutely. It goes right. hand in hand. And I, yeah. I don't acknowledge that enough. So... It's part of the pains of that growth as well, right? We, the guys that have been around a long time and have worked hard to, to really put forth their best product in, in their content, I think it's their job and our job to educate our audience of what the difference is and explain some of the context. Because otherwise you wouldn't know. Yeah. And I'd like to see some more filters on on some of the content. Because, you know, you go back 10, 15 years, and this is something I talk about in my little rough amateur podcast, is I, 
I get to interview some of these guys and some of them are a generation or two, you know, older than I am. So they really came up in like the golden era. Yeah, yeah. Pre social media. And one of the questions I asked is like, well, what do you think is better? The way media is consumed today via social media or let's say the late 90s print tv dvds dvds and the biggest difference in that is like there were filters set in place editors all right you can't just be a somebody and have a platform to shout whatever yeah i mean it was it's basically there was like a choke point on the distribution right Mm -hmm. okay so what are they what are the what's their take their take is they usually, which surprises me, yeah. is they actually enjoy the fact that the social media age has given enough of the people that they find value in a voice and a platform for them to be discovered. Mm-hmm. Even if you got to take a heap of, yeah, you know, undesirables. You, you got to get, you got to take a few, yeah. mostly twos to get to the ten, basically. <laughs> So I, I was honestly shocked to hear that of a couple of them. Uh, yeah, I I, like, I'm hey. surprised too, but that makes sense. It does make sense. And I yeah. never really looked at it that way. Yeah. Because it's totally given someone like me an opportunity, right? But yeah. it's also paved the way for me to actually get into some of those filtered uh, platforms like a print magazine or a, you know, a TV show. And it's it's dope. But I just feel like, man... There's so much value placed in your social media, like presence now, even, even now in my, you know, normal day to day life outside of the fishing world, I meet somebody new and it's like, Oh yeah, I'll follow you on the gram. And it's like, I almost don't want to like show it to them. Cause then it's just like, Oh, you have, uh, what do you do now? Like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, and it's a thing now. It's a thing even with like the girls. He's like, I'm still a single dude, man. That's so funny, and man. it's mind-blowing how much value a single female, especially, like, you get below the age of 30. And really, it doesn't even matter what age yeah. you are. If you have, like, a big social media following, like, that's a thing. Yeah, so, like, basically, if you're newly single, guys and girls, just buy some followers, 100,000 <laughs> followers. Put Can the you little... still do that? Uh, I don't, I think, I think there's a big slowdown in that because. Well, it's, they're looking like the engagement metrics are, are th- a thing, right? All right? And if you buy, that's, that's the deal. Like if you're, you get, that's you get people. back in the day. Yeah, dude. If you get a, people with a hundred thousand followers and then they put a post out and there's 20 comments. Right. There's something very fishy Either going on. So, or... yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's as big of a thing these days. And also, you know, the algorithms on on the filtering side for Instagram get better and better every yeah. year. We're, so I take a lot of pride in the fact that every growth that you've seen on any of the platforms I've been involved with have been thousand percent organic. Yeah. And I mean, also that's advertisers. That's what they care about. Like, and frankly, I've been you know, so pissed off lately at like platforms like Facebook or even Instagram now. Yeah. Because like, it seems like they're trying to level the playing field for everybody else. That's incapable of producing original impactful organic content because that's what i rode yeah I rode that stuff to where i am today and they're 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 making you pay for impressions and it's just like what like no so i refuse to do that whole pay to play thing especially like on facebook or instagram yeah like i just won't do this it. post is doing better 98 percent like, better than blah 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 get the pay 200 here. bucks and you can you can boost it it's like uh, dude i'm not about that game so, yeah but you know it's it's just like the fishing landscape it's always going to change it's always going to have some kind of new uh influx or dynamic or something that we have to adapt to yeah and i'm continually trying to adapt to that so for a brand new youtuber yep in you know in our current time frame what should they be focusing on most importantly? It sounds like just, okay, let, let me back up. Like brand new dude comes up to you, Oliver, I want to get in. I want to, I, I, you know, I, I'm into fishing in my area. I live in Wisconsin. 
I, what's my setup? Like, what should I get camera right wise and give me like, what's the most important thing for me to focus on, on YouTube? And let me, let me touch on something that really like irks me is when somebody comes up to me and, uh, tries to label me as a YouTuber. Mm. Oh man, that really bugs me. And this is in a slight at people that do consider themselves YouTubers or fishing YouTubers in particular. Yeah. But I feel like, I think I know where you're going at this. A YouTuber is really diminishing everything else that I'm capable of. Yeah. And especially with kids, like, man, I want to be a YouTuber when I grow up. I'm like, how about you be a dope-ass person that does stuff on YouTube, on Instagram, on yeah. Facebook, on whatever. So you so would tell that kid, yeah. go learn how to fish first, right? Go <laughs> be someone dope first before you have yeah. these crazy aspirations because... I feel like I've got so much further to to go in my growth and development as yeah. as a person and as an angler. Like, dude, I'm yeah. still learning all the freaking time. Well, let me rephrase it then. Too too many of them want like instant gratification. Yeah, it's I got not you. Going to happen, and so, the only way they see a semblance of that reality is by freaking selling out and being corny as hell. And if you want to right. earn the respect of those that came before you, that's the wrong path. What did you say? that You said the, the circle jerk to the top? Yeah, man. <laughs> that made me laugh. Uh, I'm not down for that. Game. And it's just all the all the gambits and bullshit that that people are doing to, to get traction right now. Yeah, and just remember, like, to the newcomers, man, like, attention is not the same thing as respect. And, it, and you got to understand what your goals are in doing this. And if you can stay true to yourself, whatever those goals are, that's the only way you're going to be able to sustain it, number one. And, and really should be doing it for the right reasons. And that's hopefully because you love it. Yeah. And you want to contribute to that space in a positive fashion. Uh, and you're not doing it for some weird, twisted sense of fame or success or money. Because all those things are fleeting, man. Like, that's all. None of, none of, that, none of that is promised. Right, I, we only have thirty-five thousand some odd subscribers on our Big Bass Rings YouTube channel, but I feel confident when somebody comes up to me and they tell me that they've watched my video, that like, oh man, I remember when you wore that thong off on that freaking mountain bike off the you know the cliff or whatever. Like, nah, bro, that wasn't me. Like, we don't do, we don't, we don't play that game. Like, we're not in it for attention. Yeah, we're in it for these reasons. Because we feel fishing is that cool, it is that dope, that you don't need to fluff it with any extras. Like, if you can really capture those moments that we've all been fortunate to live, right, in its truest form, like, dude, that's as dope as you need it to be. Yeah. And that's that's something we struggled with our freaking reality show, because it was a full-on Hollywood production. And they were trying to get us to do extra stuff, and we are like, nah, like... We're two kids from the suburbs of LA, urban as hell. My boy is dope. I'm dope. Just let us be ourselves. The fishing is dope. Like, just let us be. Like, there's enough drama in what we do. There's enough, like, storyline. Just just shoot it for what it is, and you're not going to be upset at the end result. And they weren't. It was a great show. It was entertaining, somewhat informative, a little... You know, restrictive and what we could really do with it. But that's a battle like everybody that wants to produce content has to fight, you know, with themselves, really. Yeah. Because I feel like our 35,000 subscribers are worth more as an audience to the partners that we have in our endorsements, especially. All right. Because those 35,000 people are probably more likely to buy an $800 well, mega bass. Well, yeah, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got the, they, you've got the, the audience that they've, they're paying a lot of money to get filtered into and connected with. You know, that's, right. that's the whole point. Um, all that content is, is a natural filter for the, this, that type of a buyer and, and person that they want to be associated with, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we t- I take a lot of pride in, in the partnerships that I've built. Yeah. With the brands, with the people I collaborate with. Yeah, you have to. And, and it matters because you are who you surround yourself with. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Um, it's getting late. 
So good luck. <laughs> yeah. You're going to need it. No, what the, you're going to really need is a hell of a work ethic. Yeah, it's just a lot of work, man. It's just a shit ton of work. But um, cool. Well, I hope you guys got something out of this tonight. Um, well, or today, whenever you're listening to it. It's a longer episode than it, our normal cool. uh, bonus episodes, but... Um, yeah, we're gonna we we're gonna shoot another bonus episode, right? I, yeah, I know we got another one to do. So, uh, thanks for listening to this one. If you like this episode, rate us on iTunes, um, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Oliver, um, how can folks find you? Uh, well, YouTube is definitely a great place to uh, engage with what I'm doing with what Big Bass Streams is doing. So, YouTube.com forward slash Big Bass Dreams and Oliver Nye, that's N-G-Y. Uh, and you can find us on all the popular social media platforms. Special thanks to our sponsors. Without them, this show would not be possible. Like this episode? Leave a review. Grab some gear or become a Patreon supporter. Links are in this episode's description. This show is part of the Barbless Podcast Network. For sponsorship inquiries or general questions, please email fishon at barbless.co. No better, fish better. This has been an AMP Audio Production.